Within the last several decades, there's been a lot of study about conflict resolution, especially in the workplace. Many businesses depend upon the Thomas Kilman Conflict Mode Instrument, which is a tool that measures a person's response to conflict by mapping their reactions on a grid measuring assertiveness and cooperativeness. The Thomas Kilman Instrument, or TKI, identifies five different styles of conflict, competing, accommodating, avoiding, collaborating, and compromising. Of all the different modes of conflict and resolution, compromise is right in the middle of all of it. Compromise is what we often think of as being the ultimate mode of conflict resolution, where everybody gets at least a little something of what they want. On the other hand, compromise is also where nobody is too assertive, but where nobody is all that cooperative either. Essentially, nobody gets or loses everything they want or need. While we might think compromise is the best way to reconcile our differences, to be honest, compromise really doesn't fit with who God is and what God does. Very simply, God does not compromise. God said through the prophet Balaam in Numbers 23 verse 19, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise? and not fulfill. God doesn't compromise because God doesn't change. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 102 verses 25 through 27, In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them and they will be discarded. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. Because God doesn't change, his plan doesn't change either. Uh, The psalmist continues in Psalm 102, verse 28, The children of your servants will live in your presence. Their descendants will be established before you. And this is what God had promised Abraham. Even after Abraham and Sarah tried to start a family by having a child through Sarah's slave, Hagar, God said in Genesis chapter 17, verses 6 and 7, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God made that promise in Genesis chapter 12, and and he repeats it here. God doesn't change. God's plan doesn't change. God doesn't compromise, but despite even Abraham's lack of faith, God does collaborate. Collaboration is that mode of conflict resolution where God cooperates with mankind, not by compromising, but by asserting his holy will so that his plan will be accomplished in a way that's far greater than sinful, rebellious mankind could ever imagine. God didn't compromise and work through Ishmael, the son Abraham had with Sarah's slave, Hagar, when he was 86 years old. When Abraham was 99 years old, God repeated his promise to Abraham, saying in Genesis 18, verse 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And then we read in Genesis 21, verses 1 through 5, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Even though Abraham and Sarah didn't fully trust God to fulfill his promise, God continued to accomplish his plan through them by giving them a son, Isaac. Now we need to understand that having a son wasn't the fulfillment of God's plan. The plan wasn't just to have a son. Abraham already fathered a son, Ishmael. 
God's plan was to restore mankind to himself. As he said in Genesis 17, verse 7, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God's plan was to make Abraham and his descendants his people and to be their God. God's plan was reconciliation. And by giving Abraham and Sarah a son after their unfaithful plan, God began fulfilling his plan by reconciling Abraham and Sarah to himself. But that was just the beginning. God continued to fulfill his plan through Isaac. Now forgive me for fast forwarding through a lot of important things, but more conflict was yet to come. Uh, We read in Genesis 25, verses 21 through 23, that Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and the two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the twins, Esau and Jacob, were born, they were complete opposites, and those differences were amplified into conflict. That conflict grew when Esau, it says in Genesis 25 verse 34, despised his birthright. Uh, That's the the right of the older brother to get the greater inheritance from their father. And he sold it to Jacob for some lentil stew. The conflict erupted when Jacob, with the help of his mother Rebekah, deceived their father Isaac to receive the blessing that was meant for Esau. And it says in Genesis 27, verse 41, that Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So knowing that Esau was planning to kill Jacob, it says in Genesis 28 that Isaac sent Jacob away to find a wife among his mother's relatives. And there it tells us in Genesis 29 that Jacob found a wife, actually two wives, two sisters who had their own competitive conflict, plus their slave girls. Uh, who they dragged into their conflict. And eventually, in Genesis 29 and 30, uh, they all gave Jacob 12 sons and a daughter. Through that time, in Genesis chapter 30 and 31, Jacob worked for his father-in-law and became very wealthy, but that caused more conflict for Jacob with his in-laws. So God sent him home to Canaan. Do you see a problem with that? Well, who is at home? It was Jacob's brother Esau who had vowed to kill Jacob. He was back home waiting. In Genesis chapter 32, as they're going home, Jacob sent messengers ahead of the caravan of wives and children and herds, hoping to find a favorable response from his brother Esau. And then it says in Genesis 32 verse 6, when the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau and now he is coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. Well, that doesn't sound like good news, does it? Jacob didn't think so, and so he divided up the caravan into two groups. And then he prayed. We read the prayer in Genesis 32, verses 9 through 12. It tells us that Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children." But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. And then Jacob spent the night uh, gathering a gift for his brother. 
Then we read in Genesis chapter 33, verses 1 through 11, that Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you? he asked. Jacob answered, They are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau asked, What's the meaning of all these flocks and herds I met? To find favor in your eyes, my lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob, if I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. Please accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Jacob and Esau were reconciled. There's a big sigh of relief, right? Jacob had run away from his brother who had vowed to kill him. When he returned home and heard that Esau was coming with 400 men, Jacob put some of his herds out in front as a gift for Esau. And then he put his second favorite wife and the two slave women and all their children out in front so that his favorite wife and son might escape if Esau decided to attack. But everything worked out fine, better than Jacob expected. Now, did all of it work out fine because Jacob, the deceiver, played his cards right again? No, it worked out because God was working to accomplish his plan despite Jacob's worst tendencies and despite his best efforts. Jacob and Esau were reconciled because God works to reconcile sinful, rebellious mankind to himself. They were reconciled because Jacob trusted God to fulfill his promise, even though Jacob's life and and actions didn't always reflect that kind of faith in God. And once again, as, as we've seen throughout these accounts of the generations throughout Genesis, when sinful, rebellious people turn back to God and put their faith in him, God works in them and through them and despite them to fulfill his promise and to accomplish his plan. Now remember, God's plan is to restore the broken relationship between mankind and God, to reconcile us to himself. And he promised Abraham, then Isaac, and now Jacob, that he would accomplish that plan by making them a great nation and blessing all people through them. So here, in this intense reunion between brothers separated by conflict, Jacob put his faith in God to keep his promise and to accomplish his plan. And as we witness Jacob's reconciliation with his brother Esau, we find that if we're going to overcome our conflict, we must reconcile with God to bless others. Now, I think that's what we find in Jacob's prayer. In Genesis 32, verse 9, Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, You who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. When Jacob prayed to God, referring to him as God of Abraham and Isaac, he was acknowledging God's promise and plan and God's work to fulfill that promise and plan through his father and grandfather. When Jacob acknowledged that God had spoken to him and led him to return home despite his brother's threat to kill him, Jacob revealed his own faith in God and how he needed to trust God despite his own fear. When Jacob turned back to God, God enabled Jacob to trust him as he led Jacob to reconcile with Esau 
and not just for his own safety, but for the blessing of all. In this account of reconciliation, we also discover that our conflict is with God and that it affects our relationships with other people. And when we, re- when we seek peace with God, that reconciliation blesses others as well. Just as Jacob realized he needed to turn to God, we need to understand that our conflict is also with God. Clearly, Jacob knew that his troubles and his fear were not just uh, with his brother. He knew that his conflict ultimately was with God. And so he prayed in Genesis 32, verse 10, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness that you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Jacob recognized that he had been unfaithful to God, who had been faithful to him. And even though God had blessed him, even made him prosperous and wealthy, Jacob knew he didn't deserve it. When they met, and Esau asked where all the women and children had come from. In Genesis chapter 33, verse 5, Jacob answered, They are the children that God has graciously given your servant. When Esau first refused the gifts that Jacob offered him, Jacob said in Genesis 33, verse 11, Please accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. Now, back when they were young, Jacob didn't trust God to provide, and so he took advantage. Uh, He took what wasn't his, uh, taking advantage of his brother and deceiving their father. Now he realizes that his conflict didn't begin with Esau, but with God. And he recognizes that God has been working to reconcile Jacob to himself, blessing him with grace. We must recognize this ourselves. I mean, yes, we have conflict with other people, but our conflict starts with God. James explains our problem in this way, uh, writing in James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Um, what uh, causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. This is the kind of conflict that we see throughout Genesis. Adam, his conflict wasn't with Eve. It was with God and his command, but he blamed Eve. Cain's conflict wasn't with Abel. It was with God, but Cain killed Abel. It's the same kind of conflict we find in our own lives. We want what we don't have. Money, possessions, influence, pleasure. But instead of trusting God to provide what we need, we take from others. Maybe not an outright theft, but maybe by taking time and attention away from our spouse or our kids or brothers and sisters in the church. Maybe by spending our time, money, and affection on on things or or on people that we shouldn't, uh, like gambling, drugs, porn, or a secret friend. Whatever it is, The conflict starts with God. James continues in verse 4, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, obviously, we can see that our conflict also affects others. We've already seen how Jacob's conflict with God affected his relationship with Esau and Isaac. But here we see how that conflict affected his wife and children as well. In Genesis 33 verses 1 and 2, it says that Jacob put out in front the two women uh, servants and and his children with them. And then Leah and his children with her. And then Rachel and Joseph in the rear. Because he was afraid of Esau and what he might do, Jacob divided up his family in order of importance to himself, saving the wife and son he loved most behind the ones who were apparently more expendable. Now, as we read through the rest of the accounts of the generations of Jacob and his children, we find out just how much that attitude affected their relationships and actions. Now, we know that too, don't we? We know that our conflict with God not only leads to our conflict with other people, but also perhaps to other people's conflict with God. 
How many times have we heard how a parent's church attendance and participation is not only reflected but amplified in their children? Uh, when kids see that a relationship with God isn't all that important to mom and dad, it's often less important to their kids. But when kids see mom and dad in a healthy relationship with God, they often grow as well. Now, how many times are we going to have to hear how often unbelievers are turned off to God and His church because of the behavior of those who claim to be Christians? And how long are we going to say that that is just an excuse before we actually do something about ourselves? Jesus warned about hypocrisy in Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Even though our conflict uh, might begin with God, it often affects others. And so we must reconcile with God in order to bless others. Now, since our conflict is with God, so our peace starts with God. Jacob was expecting an attack from his brother, and so he prayed to God for peace, saying in Genesis 32, verses 11 and 12, Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said... I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. Even though he feared his brother, Jacob prayed to God for salvation, for peace. How did Jacob know to trust God for deliverance? Because of God's promise. Because God promised Jacob that he would make him prosper as he had promised Isaac and Abraham, Jacob knew that he would find peace with Esau when he found peace with God. Because he had turned to God and was reconciled to God, Jacob could face Esau with confidence. And so we read in Genesis 33, verse 3, that he himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. Having peace that began with God, Jacob approached his brother in peace. And that peace grew as Esau approached Jacob. It says in Genesis 33 verse 4 that Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him and they wept. Jacob demonstrated what Paul told the early church in Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When we find peace with God, we can find peace with other people. And I think that's why Jacob could say in Genesis 33, verse 10, to, to his brother Esau, to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. I think it's unfortunate that we often try to find confidence for dealing with conflict by preparing for more conflict. Uh, perhaps the, the most common handgun caliber in the world is the 9mm parabellum. Uh, the word parabellum comes from a Latin phrase, uh, civis pacem parabellum. If you want peace, prepare for war. However, the good news of God's plan is peace. Ultimately, peace with God. The Apostle Peter said that this was the message God first revealed to his people, Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, Peter said, uh, in the presence of Cornelius and the Gentiles, in Acts chapter 10, uh, verse 36, he says, You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their descendants. He is the blessing to all nations that God promised would come through Abraham and his descendants. Just as when Jacob put his faith in God and found peace with God, when we put our faith in Jesus, we also find peace with God. Paul told the early church in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Since we have been justified through faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we have peace with God, our peace blesses others. And we see this in Jacob's gifts to Esau. In his prayer, Jacob remembered that God promised to prosper him. And so Jacob sent herds of goats and sheep and camels and donkeys in waves ahead of his family. And so Jacob thought to himself in Genesis 32 verse 20, I will pacify him with these gifts I am sending on ahead. Later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. God had blessed Jacob, and so Jacob, seeking peace, blessed Esau. And it says in Genesis 33, verse 8, Esau asked, What's the meaning of all these flocks and herds I met? To find favor in your eyes, my lord, he said. When Esau rejected the gift, Jacob insisted, saying in Genesis 33, verse 11, Please accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Because he had found peace with God, trusting God to provide what he had promised, Jacob offered that peace to Esau, and Esau accepted it. This is the fulfillment of God's promise and plan. When we are reconciled to God and find peace with God, we can be reconciled to others, and we can bless them with the peace that we have found in God. Now, church, that's our job, to reconcile people to God. Paul told the early church that this is God's work of collaboration with us, uh, writing in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 20, that all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God promised Abraham that he would bless all people through him. And the fulfillment of that promise accomplishes God's plan of reconciling the world to himself, providing peace with God for all people who will turn to him in faith, as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their faithful descendants did. Again, the fulfillment of that promise has come through Jesus. The question now is, will you accept it? You know how much conflict that you have in your life, whether it's at home or at work, somewhere in your community or or wherever. Ultimately, that conflict is with God. And the good news is that God wants to reconcile that conflict with you so that you might have peace with Him and peace with others so that you might bless them. And you can find that reconciliation with God when you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God who died on the cross to forgive our sins and who rose again to give us new life. When you repent turning away from your old sinful way of life and turning back to God for new life. When you confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life and when you join with Jesus by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. When you do that, you'll be saved. God will forgive you and God the Holy Spirit will come and live within you, helping you to live this new life in peace with Him and with others. Now, if you're ready to make that decision uh, or if you've got any questions about anything Uh, that that I've said, Uh, I invite you to contact me at Athens Church of Christ so that we can get together and work through all of that as soon as possible. But until then, please let me pray for you. Father God, you know that our lives are in constant conflict in, in our homes, in our marriages, in our families, in our workplace, in our community, basically with everyone, everywhere we go, especially with you. Father God, I'm overwhelmed that you want to have a relationship with me, with all of us, despite our sinful rebellion against you. And I praise you for your plan to reconcile us to yourself through Jesus and our faith in him. And so right now I pray for those who have not yet put their faith in Jesus. Father God, lead them to yourself through your word and by your Holy Spirit and with the help of your people, the church. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.